the meditations of the emperor marcus aurelius antoninus by marcus aurelius book one i learned from my grandfather virus to use good manners and to put restraint on anger in the famous memory of my father i had a pattern of modesty and manliness of my mother I learned to be pious and generous, to keep myself not only from evil deeds, but even from evil thoughts, and to live with a simplicity which is far from customary among the rich. I owe it to my great-grandfather that I did not attend public lectures and discussions, but had good and able teachers at home and I owe him also the knowledge that for things of this nature a man should count no expense too great. My tutor taught me not to favor either green or blue at the chariot races, nor in the contests of gladiators to be a supporter either of light or heavy armed. He taught me also to endure labor, not to need many things, to serve myself without troubling others, not to intermeddle in the affairs of others, and not easily to listen to slanders against them. Of Diognetus I had the lesson not to busy myself about vain things, not to credit the great professions of such as pretend to work wonders, or of sorcerers about their charms, and their expelling of demons and the like, not to keep quails for fighting or divination, nor to run after such things, to suffer freedom of speech in others, and to apply myself heartily to philosophy. Him also I must thank for my hearing first Bacchus, then Tindasis, and Marcianus, that I wrote dialogues in my youth, and took a liking to the philosopher's palate and skins, and to the other things which by the Grecian discipline belong to that profession. To Rusticus I owe my first apprehensions that my nature needed reform and cure, and that I did not fall into the ambition of the common sophists either by composing speculative writings or by declaiming harangues of exhortation in public. Further, that I never strove to be admired by ostentation of great patience in an aesthetic life, or by display of activity and application, that I gave over the study of rhetoric, poetry, and the graces of language, and that I did not pace my house in the senatorial robes or practice any similar affectation. I observed also the simplicity of style in his letters, particularly in that which he wrote to my mother from Sinuesa. I learned from him to be easily appeased, and to be readily reconciled with those who had displeased me or given cause of offense so soon as they inclined to make their peace, to read with care, not to rest satisfied with a slight and superficial knowledge, nor quickly to assent to great talkers. I have him to thank that I met with the discourses of Epictetus, which he furnished me from his own library. From Apollonius I learned true liberty and tenacity of purpose, to regard nothing else even in the smallest degree, but reason always, and always to remain unaltered in the agonies of pain, in the losses of children, or in long diseases. He afforded me a living example of how the same man can upon occasion be most yielding and most inflexible. He was patient in exposition, and, as might well be seen, esteemed his fine skill and ability in teaching others the principles of philosophy as the least of his endowments.
It was from him that I learned how to receive from friends what are thought favors, without seeming humbled by the giver, or insensible to the gift. Sextus was my pattern of a benign temper, and his family the model of a household governed by true paternal affection and a steadfast purpose of living according to nature. Here I could learn to be grave without affectation, to observe sagaciously the several dispositions and inclinations of my friends, to tolerate the ignorant and those who follow current opinions without examination. His conversation showed how a man may accommodate himself to all men and to all companies. For though companionship with him was sweeter and more pleasing than any sort of flattery, yet he was at the same time highly respected and reverenced. No man was ever more happy than he in comprehending, finding out, and arranging in exact order the great maxims necessary for the conduct of life. His example taught me to suppress even the least appearance of anger or any other passion, but still with all this perfect tranquility, to possess the tenderest and most affectionate heart, to be apt to approve others yet without noise, to have much learning and little ostentation. I learned from Alexander the Grammarian to avoid censuring others, to refrain from flouting them for a barbarism, solecism, or any false pronunciation. Rather was I dexterously to pronounce the words rightly in my answer, confining approval or objection to the matter itself and avoiding discussion of the expression, or to use some other form of courteous suggestion. Fronto made me sensible how much of envy, deceit, and hypocrisy surrounds princes, and that generally those whom we account nobly born have somehow less natural affection. I learned from Alexander the Platonist, not often nor without great necessity, to say or write to any man in a letter that I am not at leisure, nor thus under pretext of urgent affairs to make a practice of excusing myself from the duties which, according to our various ties, we owe to those with whom we live. Of Catullus I learned not to condemn any friend's expostulation, even though it were unjust, but to try to recall him to his former disposition to stint no praise in speaking of my masters, as is recounted of Demetius and Athenodorus, and to love my children with true affection. Of Severus, my brother, I learned to love my kinsmen, to love truth, to love justice. Through him I came to know Thrasia, Helvidius, Cato, Bion, and Brutus, he gave me my first conception of a commonwealth founded upon equitable laws and administered with equality of right, and of a monarchy whose chief concern is the freedom of its subjects. Of him I learned likewise a constant and harmonious devotion to philosophy, to be ready to do good, to be generous with all my heart. He taught me to be of good hope and trustful of the affection of my friends. I observed in him candor in declaring what he condemned in the conduct of others, and so frank and open was his behavior that his friends might easily see without the trouble of conjecture what he liked or disliked. The counsels of Maximus taught me to command myself, to judge clearly, to be of good courage in sickness and other misfortunes, to be moderate, gentle, yet serious in disposition, and to accomplish my appointed task without repining. All men believed that he spoke as he thought, 
and whatever he did, they knew it was done with good intent. I never found him surprised or astonished at anything. He was never in a hurry, never shrank from his purpose, was never at a loss or dejected. He was no facile smiler, but neither was he passionate or suspicious. He was ready to do good, to forgive and to speak the truth, and gave the impression of unperverted rectitude rather than of a reformed character. No man could ever think himself despised by Maximus, and no one ever ventured to think himself his superior. He had also a good gift of humor. I learned from my father gentleness and undeviating constancy in judgments, formed after due reflection, not to be puffed up with glory as men understand it, to be laborious and assiduous. He taught me to give ready hearing to any man who offered anything tending to the common good, to mete out impartial justice to everyone, to apprehend rightly when severity and when clemency should be used, to abstain from all impure lusts, and to use humanity towards all men. Thus he left his friends at liberty to sup with him or not, to go abroad with him or not, exactly as they inclined. And they found him still the same if some urgent business had prevented them from obeying his commands. I learned of him accuracy and patience in counsel, for he never quitted an inquiry satisfied with first impressions. I observed his zeal to retain his friends without being fickle or over-fond, his contentment in every condition, his cheerfulness, his forethought about very distant events, his unostentatious attention to the smallest details, his restraint of all popular applause and flattery, ever watchful of the needs of the empire, a careful steward of the public revenue, he was tolerant of the censure of others in affairs of that kind. He was neither a superstitious worshipper of the gods, nor an ambitious pleaser of men, nor studious of popularity, but in all things sober and steadfast, well skilled in what was honorable, never affecting novelties. As to the things which make the ease of life, and which fortune can supply in such abundance, he used them without pride, and yet with all freedom, enjoyed them without affectation when they were present, and when absent, he found no want of them. No man could call him sophist, buffoon, or pedant. He was a man of ripe experience, a full man, one who could not be flattered, and one who could govern himself, as well as others. I further observed that he honored all who were true philosophers without upbraiding the rest, and without being led astray by any. His manners were easy, his conversation delightful, but not cloying. He took regular but moderate care of his body, neither as one over-fond of life or the adornment of his person, nor as one who despised these things. Thus, through his own care, he seldom needed any medicines, whether salves or potions. It was his special merit to yield without envy to any who acquired any special faculty as either eloquence or learning in the law, in ancient customs, or the like. And he aided such men strenuously so that every one of them might be regarded and esteemed for his special excellence. He observed carefully the ancient customs of his forefathers, and preserved, without appearance of affectation, the ways of his native land. He was not fickle and capricious, and loved not change of place or employment. 
After his violent fits of headache, he would return fresh and vigorous to his wanted affairs. Of secrets he had few, and these seldom, and such only as concerned public matters. He displayed discretion and moderation in exhibiting shows for the entertainment of the people in his public works, in his largesses and the like. And in all those things he acted like one who regarded only what was right and becoming in the things themselves, and not the reputation that might follow after. He never bathed at unseasonable hours, had no vanity in building, was never solicitous either about his food or about the make or color of his clothes, or about the beauty of his servants. His dress came from Lorium, his villa on the coast, and was of Lanuvian wool for the most part. It is remembered how he used the tax collector Tusculum, who asked his pardon, and all his behavior was of a piece with that. He was far from being inhuman or implacable, or violent, never doing anything with such keenness that one can say he was sweating about it. In all things, he reasoned distinctly, as one at leisure, calmly, regularly, resolutely, and consistently. A man might fairly apply to him, which is recorded of Socrates, that he could both abstain from and enjoy these things in want whereof many show themselves weak, and in the possession intemperate. To be strong in abstinence, and temperate in enjoyment, to be sober in both, these are qualities of a man of perfect and invincible soul, as was shown in the sickness of Maximus. To the gods I owe it, that I had good grandfathers and parents, a good sister, good teachers, good servants, good kinsmen and friends, good almost all of them. I have to thank them that I never through haste and rashness offended any of them, though my temper was such as might have led me to it, had occasion offered. But by their goodness, no such concurrence of circumstances happened as could discover my weakness. I am further thankful that I was not longer brought up with my grandfather's concubine, that I retained my modesty, and refrained even longer than need have been from the pleasures of love. To the gods it is due that I lived under the government of such a prince and father as could take from me all vainglory, and convince me that it was not impossible for a prince to live in a court without guards, gorgeous robes, torches, statues, or such pieces of state and magnificence, but that he may reduce himself almost to the state of a private man, and yet not become more mean or remiss in those public affairs, wherein power and authority are requisite. I thank the gods that I have had such a brother, as by his disposition might stir me to take care of myself, while at the same time he delighted me by his respect and love. I thank them that my children neither wanted good, natural dispositions, nor were deformed in body. I owe it to their good guidance that I made no greater progress in rhetoric and poetry, and in other studies, which might have engrossed my mind, had I found myself successful in them. By the God's grace I forestalled the wishes of those by whom I was brought up, in promoting them to the dignities they seemed most to desire. I did not put them off with the hope that since they were but young, I would do it hereafter. I owe to the gods that I ever knew Apollonius, Rusticus, and Maximus, and that I have had occasion often and effectually to meditate with myself and inquire what is truly the life according to nature, 
and as far as lies within the dispensation of the gods to give suggestion, help, or inspiration, there is nothing to prevent my having already realized that life. I have fallen short of it by my own fault, and because I give no heed to the inward omissions and almost direct instructions of the gods, to whom be thanks that my body hath so long endured the stress of such a life as I have led. By their goodness, I never had to do with either Benedicta or Theodotus, and afterwards, when I fell into some foolish passions, I was soon cured. I give thanks that having often been displeased with Rusticus, I never did anything to him which afterwards I might have had occasion to repent, that though my mother was destined to die young, she lived with me all her latter years, that, as often as I inclined to succor any who were either poor or had fallen into some distress, I was never answered that there was not ready money enough to do it, that I myself never had need of the like succor from another. I must be grateful, too, that I have such a wife, so obedient, so loving, so ingenuous, that I had choice of fit and able men to whom I might commit the education of my children. I have received divine aids in dreams, in particular how I might stay my spitting of blood and cure my vertigo, which good fortune happily fell to me at Caeta. The gods watched over me, also when I first applied myself to philosophy. For I fell not into the hands of any sophist, nor sat poring over many volumes, nor devoted myself to solving syllogisms or stargazing. That all these things should so happily fall out, there was great need both for the help of fortune and for the aid of the gods. In the country of the Quadi, by the Granwa. End of book one.